Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, make lexico graphically smallest array by swapping elements. I really hate this word. I don't think I've ever pronounced it correctly, but the idea in this problem is that we are given an array of integers. So suppose something like this, and this is actually a very good example. We're given a list of integers, but we're also given a limit. In this case, let's say it is two. Our goal here is to take this input array and make it as close to a sorted array as possible. That's pretty much what they mean by lexicographically smallest. Now, even for me, this was a little bit ambiguous. I wasn't quite clear what they meant, but I think this paragraph actually does a decent job of explaining it because I wasn't quite sure if uh, we had like 11, 11, and two, is this uh, considered sorted because if you go digit by digit, I mean, yes, we have one, one, two, but if you were to go number by number, we have 11 and two, obviously 11 is bigger than two. So we would actually want this to look like two 11. Thankfully, this is what they are talking about and not this one. If we were looking at this one, it would definitely be more complicated because we would have to go digit by digit. So thankfully the problem isn't too crazy, but it's still not easy. That's for sure. So the output for this is actually just going to be sorted. So we'll end up with one, three, five, eight, nine. That is the output. The problem isn't as simple as just taking the input and sorting it because we are only allowed to do this operation. We are only allowed to swap two elements if the absolute difference between those elements is less than or equal to two, that specifically comes from our limit. So that's not a fixed number. It has to be less than or equal to the limit. So we cannot swap one and five. We could swap five and three, and that's exactly what we do to end up with this. And then we also swap nine and eight, and then we end up like this. So what we specifically want to do is not determine which swaps we need to make, but we specifically just want to create the output array that is as close to sorted as possible. Meaning for the first digit, we try to uh, put the smallest number we can. When I say digit, I meant like this position. We try to put the smallest number we can. And then for the next spot, we try to put the smallest number that's then available. And then we keep kind of doing that. So in some sense, you can think of it as like a greedy solution, or at the very least, like we want the output to be greedy as much as we can. But the solution may not necessarily be greedy, but that was definitely the first thing that came to my mind. And I guess the solution could be thought of as greedy, but it's not as simple as just finding like the smallest possible element among everything available to us and seeing if it could be swapped with the element that is currently at that position. It's not that simple. And I'll actually get into why that is with an example right now. I think this problem is a really good showcase of why the correct examples can really lead you to the optimal solution, choosing good examples. So that's exactly what I'm going to try to do. And hopefully the solution will become obvious. So imagine if I had something like this three, two, one, it's just sorted in descending order. And suppose I give a limit of one. I chose this intentionally. Why did I pick this example? Because I want to know. Would that greedy solution I was talking about, would it work? Could I just take, uh, let's say all of these elements, maybe throw them in like a heap or something like that, and then do something like this, where for the first element here, of, among everything I have, I pick the minimum because I want this to be sorted. So I pick one and then I check, can one be swapped with three? Well, right now the absolute difference is two. That's bigger than the limit. So it cannot be swapped. But isn't it still possible that one could possibly end up there? Because maybe we put the two there first. So then I end up with something like this, two, three. And then we have one here and then I put the one over there and I end up with one, three, two. And then I end up with one, two, three because I can just swap these two. So it's actually definitely possible to get this to be sorted. It takes a bunch of swaps, that's for sure but it's still possible. We don't have to worry about the individual swaps. We just want to care about the result. So what this kind of tells me is that if I have a bunch of elements, no matter how they are ordered, if I have five, six, seven, and then I put the eight over here and then like the nine over here and then 10 and then 11, 
and I just go crazy and I just randomize all of them as long as the elements are contiguous when it comes to the limit, meaning like for these elements, I can do five, six, seven, like it's contiguous. There's no gap anywhere that is bigger than the limit. All of these numbers are different by one. The absolute difference is one. When you take all of the elements, you sort them, and then you look at the adjacent gaps, you see that they are all within the limit. So the output can just be a single sorted array. So now you might think that, wow, that solution is pretty easy maybe. But no, it does get a bit more complicated because we haven't considered the alternative. What happens when the gap is too big? Now let's think of another example. Just to make a very trivial one, the one I thought of was this. Let's just put a five over here. Now what happens? Well, it's still possible to sort these three. We can get one, two, three, but five is fixed. There's not a single number in the input array where the absolute difference is less than or equal to one. So wherever five happens to be, it's going to stay there. If five was instead somewhere at the end, it would have stayed there as well. Well, that would have been good because then we would have ended up with something like this. But even if it was in the middle, if I put a five over here, let me redraw that to make it a bit more readable. So uh, these are my elements now. Once again, five cannot be changed. So what do we do with the rest of them? Well, we can still swap between them. It doesn't matter how far of a swap we're making. Like swaps do not have to be adjacent. So what we can do is once again, basically swap uh, these two. So we'd end up with two, three, and then I'd put the one over there. So I'd end up with one, three, two, and then I would do the swap between these two. And I would once again, end up with one, two, three. If you just ignore the gap over here, then we're pretty much doing the same thing. We still have three slots. We're still kind of performing the same swaps and still getting these numbers sorted in relative order, even though there happens to be a gap in between them. So now I'm starting to build a little bit of intuition. Now I'm wondering, well, what if that a number five, what if there were two of them, not two fives, but two numbers that couldn't be swapped with the other numbers. So maybe I have six and five. Well, they can still be swapped with each other because now the difference between these is within one. Maybe if this was a seven, it would have been, you know, seven stays here, five stays here, and then we sort these three. But right now it's a bit more interesting because now we have two sections. We have this section where everything has an absolute difference of one, same thing here. So this could be sorted into five, six, and this could be independently sorted into one, two, three. Now, if you're still not convinced, one last example, I think, before we get into the solution now is going to be this. What if I put six first and then three and then five and then two and one? What would the output look like then? Well, I'll make it nice and simple for you. I'll even color code it. We have one group here and we have a second group over here. Each group is going to be individually sorted. So take all of these elements, sort them, you get one, two, three. They have to stay in the same positions that they are like allowed to be in. And the same thing with the other guys, five is gonna go here and six is gonna go here. That's our output. So now we have an idea or at least some intuition on how to solve the problem. We kind of know what we're looking to do. We are going to try to identify these groups and then uh, we can kind of build the output. The question is, how do we actually go about doing this? If you wanna challenge yourself, I encourage you to try to code it up yourself. Otherwise, I will explain it to you now. So this is the dry run. The first step is to form the groups. I think that's not super crazy. I think you could probably guess that that's the first thing we'd wanna do, at least like identify the groups. How could we possibly get the output if we don't know what the groups are? And we know that the groups are kind of based on elements that are contiguous. So it makes sense, I think, to just take the input and sort it. So in this example, after we sort it, we will end up with one, two, three, five, and six. And in this case, our limit is still equal to one. You can imagine that if the limit was two, uh, for this example, then everything could be swappable. Or maybe we would have an array like one, three, five, and like seven. In this case, the array would be sortable as well. I'm just mentioning this right now because I know I kind of stuck with a limit of one for most of the examples. 
but it is possible the limit could be bigger and that doesn't really change the solution anyways now we have the sorted array so now what we do is we start forming groups so i'm going to put that into an array of queues you'll see why i'm using queues in a second but you could also use arrays of arrays if you want to but basically we just need to group numbers together so we go left to right we see this is the first number we have nothing here yet so what i'm going to do is create a queue i'm going to draw it as an array but now i created the first queue and i'm going to throw one in there okay now i look at two i look at the previous element i added the difference is less than or equal to our limit which uh, should be one now so i throw a two in there i look at three same thing i can throw three in there as well then i get to five here's where it gets interesting because now the difference is greater than the limit so now i create a new queue so this is my second group and I throw five in there and then I can throw six in there as well. So that's step one, just getting the groups. So now I'm gonna kind of get rid of this part. We know that this is the array that we started in. So now we kind of want to start filling in the groups. I'm color coding it just to show you what the groups are. But now how do we even approach doing something like this? Well, I guess you could say that this is kind of the greedy part. I don't know like 100%, but it feels kind of greedy to me. What we're doing now is going left to right. And for each position, it would be convenient for us to know that, okay, this position belongs to this group, or maybe it belongs to this group. It doesn't matter. We would just like to be able to know which group this position belongs to because then we can fill it in we're trying to ultimately create the output array so i'll draw that right below it so we'd like to be able to say which group does this number belong to okay it belongs to this group so just take the first element from there or you could say pop it that's why i made this a queue because then we can pop from the beginning in constant time if we were using arrays, I think you would need like a pointer for every single one of these groups, which kind of makes things a bit more complicated because for most arrays, I think popping from the beginning would be a more inefficient operation. But anyway, so that's why I have the queue. I pop from it, I get the five. I know five is gonna be the first element that goes here. I go to the next position. Which group does this belong to? It belongs to this group. So it's not like I'm going to put a three over here. I'm going to take the first element from the group, which was one, and throw it here. And then I'm going to keep doing that. So I'll go through this part quickly. So this belongs to the next group. Even though there's a five here, we're going to take the six here and uh, put that there. And then for these next two, we're just going to take two and three and then put them there. And these two will be popped. So we will end up with the correct output. But now the question that you're wondering is how to actually get the indexes. How do you take a number and map it to which group it belongs to? So like this one belongs to the zeroth group. This one belongs to group one. How do we do the mapping? Well, you could have a separate loop for this that runs after the first loop, but you could actually do this in the same step as this. I think it'll probably be easier just to explain it in the code, but in simple terms, what we're gonna be doing is taking an individual number like six or three, and as we throw it into the group, we can just say, okay, it was thrown into the group zero, or maybe it was grouped with group one. We can kind of do the mapping at the same time. It's pretty easy. So knowing all that, we can code this up in n log n time because we are gonna have to sort the input array. And I believe it's gonna be O of n space to create these groups, but now let's code it up. In case you're wondering how I came up with the solution, pretty much if you see these comments, pretty much exactly what I explained in today's uh, drawing explanation. So I'm gonna create a couple data structures. One is gonna be the group, so list of queues, and then the next is gonna be number mapped to which group it is. So this I will say is gonna be nums of i mapped to some groups index. Once you become clear on what the data structures are, the rest of this becomes easier in my opinion. So what we wanna do is go through every number in nums, but we want it to be sorted, so that's what I'm gonna do. This will not actually sort the array, it'll create a sorted copy, I think. It's generally better to do that, I think, than actually modify the input array, but it's up to you, because this does use additional space. So now what I wanna do is add like this number to the previous group right now. So there aren't any groups added yet, but this is what I would do in Python. Groups at negative one, this will give me the last group that's in this list. And then I can say append to it the current number. And 
I also want to do this num to group so I could map this number to uh, which group it belongs to, which would pretty much just be, I think, the length of groups uh, minus one. So this part I think is pretty straightforward. Now, what do we do if either groups is empty, so if not groups, or maybe the absolute difference between this number and the previous number that we added is too big? In both of those cases, what we would do is this, groups append an instance of the deck in Python, which is just a double-ended queue. Now to add that condition, we want to do this if groups is empty, so that will happen pretty much on the first iteration of the loop, or if this is the case, the absolute value between n and the previous number we added. So let's look at the last group uh, at negative one and the last element we added, which is also going to be at negative one. This is kind of why I like Python, but I know that for people not familiar with Python, this might look kind of new or different. But you can take this difference and just check if it's greater than the limit. That means we need a new group. Otherwise, we can use the previous group. And so that's why I think this code is, in my opinion, very readable and very like simple conceptually. I know some people might find this overly complicated. Maybe I could have used more variables. Maybe I could have had like current and that tells us what the current group happens to be. And then we could have, you know, done some stuff here. If you want to do that, that's fine. But I think this is good enough. And then after that, this becomes pretty easy because we want to build our result. We want to return our result. So I'm going to go for n in nums from left to right. And this part, we're going through the original array. So just keep that in mind. You do need the original array. So then we can take num to group, pass an n as the key, and then we will get the group that it belongs to, which I'll just call j because it's going to be the index that we use within the groups. So now we know which group to uh, pick the element from. So this group, we're going to get the leftmost element and remove it. So pop left. And after it's popped, it's going to be appended to the result just like that. So I think this is pretty clean code. Maybe you think it's overcomplicated. That's fine, but it is relatively short at least. So let's run it. And uh, you can see on the left, it does work and it's pretty efficient. I will say though, don't let this code fool you. This is not an easy problem. Even when I was solving it, after like five or 10 minutes, I wasn't quite sure if I was going to be able to solve it. And then I kind of came up with those examples, realized what the trick was, and then it became pretty straightforward. But if you're a beginner, this might be difficult and that's perfectly fine. As long as you're learning, that's a good thing. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.